Fine. Okay. So, uh, great to be here. I like very much the Bangalore. I didn't know this place. It's a very nice place. And, uh, well, I'm impressed by all this audience. Um, so, thanks to Suri and uh, Sukumar for a kind invitation uh, to this place. And uh, we'll go on to the, some free sets. So, some free sets are of some interest in themselves, but also it is a way to practice a bit with the notion that have been developed by other people, including David Grinkevich, during this, uh, this um, meeting. Okay, so just a few words for introducing the, the matter. So if you have M with a given law is a monoid, that essentially you have some associative law, and uh, for what we are going to do, we are going to use only abelian laws. And uh, so, essentially an empty set with this, uh, with this associative law, otherwise, if it is not associative, you cannot do really much, uh, much mathematics. But, uh, so, uh, and uh, then um, what, you, what you look in that, if you have some part, let us say definition, a subset, this is just the introduction, I will write something more precise the, after that. Uh, subset A, subset of M, is some free. If you have the following, that each time you take A, B in M, in A, uh, then, uh, a star B does not belong to A. Okay, so this is, of course, we, we use the, the word sum because if it is abelian, usually the star law is written as a plus law. So this is just uh, something which, uh, which is some special case in some way of something which is to say uh, you can take if gamma is alpha, beta, gamma are positive. Sorry? Oh, yes, some free, thank you, <laughs> some free sets, yes. Uh, so um, it can be seen as a, some general case where you have, if you have integers, you, you have something like that, plus uh, beta b is not equal to uh, gamma c for any a, b, c in a. And another case of interest is if you have uh, gamma is equal to one. Gamma A, of course, if you say 3A, means simply A times A times A times, I mean, three times. Uh, one uh, of interest also is this one, alpha plus beta is different from 2C. And uh, this you can understand if you are in a group or something like that, uh, then you can understand it by saying that there is no arithmetic progression. Okay, so this is also something of interest, sets in which you have no arithmetic progression. So this is the, the type of thing we are, we are going to, to do. Uh, possibly before I start, I give you some notation. So essentially what we are going to look for M is something which is M can be, will be something like uh, Z will be something like uh, uh, n, natural integer, or n zero, the same with a zero in it. Uh, what else is of interest? Uh, some abelian groups. Uh, among them, you will have something like z over nz, or z over pz, when, uh, when I use p, p is always for a prime number. So this is the, the type of, uh, of sets of, of interest for us, with arithmetic interest. So, uh, going with the notation, if you have x and y, which are real numbers, then what I write is something like x, y, it's just a set of integer, it is the set of x, y, intersection, z. Okay, just the integer which are in this interval. Uh, of course, here you may have the square bracket and here the, curl, the, the, the round bracket or the other way around. I think you understand. If you have an interval of 
or you are just taking the uh, inter integer which is in this interval. Okay, now if x for x in R, uh, I think usually this notation, the floor notation is usually known. Uh, this is an element which is in Z, an integer, and uh, you have the floor of x is less than x and is strictly less than x plus 1. Okay, this is the floor function. If you have 2.3, the floor function of 2.3 is 2. And if you have an integer, the floor function of this integer is just this integer himself, itself. Okay, now something also of interest is the fractional part. Fractional part of x is x minus x. Okay, something also of interest, we may use it, is the distance to the nearest integer, as it is called. Uh, essentially, it is the minimum of uh, x minus n when n belongs to n, n belongs to z. Well, if it is an integer plus one half, there is no real nearest integer. You have two of them, but the, the distance is one half. And also a function which is maybe less used, it is the ceiling function. The way you have the floor, you have also the ceiling function, which is, uh, which write it with something above, which is x, and uh, this is in z. Oh, by the way, if you want to do that in tech, this one it will be backslash l seal, and I let you guess what is this one, okay? So, uh, and it has the following property that uh, x is, the uh, uh, ceiling is between x and x plus one. So the ceiling of three is three, and the ceiling of 2.3 is 3 also. Let's say, I mean, the ceiling of 2.4 is 3. So, good. So this is the, the way. And what is of interest for us, you can check that, that if you take the cardinality, cardinality, I will put a set between two bars, or I will put a sharp, or I will put it with the word cardinal. Uh, the cardinality, of this set, the number of integer which are between zero and x, x excluded, is the ceiling of x. And this is why we need that. Okay, so this being done, we can start our business and the part one, part one, which is finite sum free sets. Of n. So what I suggest is that we try to explore together what can it be. So let us say 1.1 1 .1 is largest, I guess you understand the notation, SFS for some free sets. Largest some free sets in 1n. Usually, when I use n, n, uh, n is indeed uh, an integer. This is well, classical. If, you have, if, you, if at some point something has to, be, has to be made precise, do not hesitate in any case just to interrupt and to ask questions. It's much better that you know what it is. So I would like to, to do some uh, exploration on that. What, what do you think as being some presets in one n? Do you have something? The first row is not, uh, is not allowed to answer. Do, do you see some sum free subsets of integers? Odd integers, okay. So, example, uh, odd integers. And uh, you'll see that the number is, just check it, the number is exactly n over two. This is why I use the, I need the ceiling function. <coughs> Odd integers, okay, do you see also something else? Well, of course, any, any set of odd integers, if you have a sum-free set, any subset of this set is also a sum-free set, this is clear. 
Can you see something else? Is some other type? The the integer which are one mod three. Yeah, okay. Integer congruent to one mod three. Okay, this was integer congruent to one mod two. This is an integer congruent to one mod three. So their number is about n over three. So uh, th this, is, this is a good example. It is different from the previous one. It's maybe not a good example if you want to, to do what is the largest one. Okay, but uh, I agree, this is fine. So we can go. We can do also something with arithmetic progression. We'll uh, we'll go on. We'll exploit that a bit later. Uh, can you see something else? Looking at the size of the elements. If you take something which is n over 2 and n. OK, this is fine too, because if you take the sum of two elements, you are larger than n. n over 2 is not allowed. They are all strictly larger than n over 2. And again, the number is n over 2 times n. And uh, if you try to find out something which is larger, you will have some difficulty. So the point is to try, can we try to figure out that maybe this is the good, uh, the, the, the largest, the size of the largest sum free sets in one end. Okay? So we can try to, to, to figure out some ways to, to look at that. Um, so one possibility is already something to say, well, the, the point is that if you have A, A which is some free sets, uh, some free sets in one end, of course, you, be, you better avoid zero, because as soon as you have zero, you are, you are dead. OK, it cannot be a some free set. So if A is uh, some free sets in one end, then, of course, if you look at a plus a, a plus a is in something like 2. This is not that bad. But what is really bad is that you go up to 2n. OK? So now, however, you are, st you are stuck in 2n. So you can say something, which is, what can you say of the cardinality? Remember that our fundamental property is that the intersection of a times a plus a is empty. This is our definition. Okay? But you know something about A plus A, that the cardinality of A plus A is at least 2A. Not exactly true, but 2A minus 1. Okay? This is the beginning of the, of the, the additive uh, theory that was developed by uh, David. Okay, so it means something that you have a set which is here. So if you write the cardinality of A, sorry, the cardinality of A, if you have the cardinality of A, you have something which would tell you that if you have A, a subfree set here, you have A plus 2A minus 1 has to be less than, let us say, up to big O of 1, I don't care much. It's just to understand well, what it can be, is less than 2N let us say plus big O of 1 plus a constant. I don't want to be delicate with the constant at that step. Essentially, I'm saying that. So it means at least you have some result which tells you that A is at most 2n over 3. Well, this is larger than this. We, we don't get that way, the, the expected upper bound. But on the other hand, we have something which is very special because you know that if this occurs, then you have an arithmetic progression. 
This can occur only if you have a full arithmetic progression. This is the, 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 the additive theory, just the very start of the additive theory of this. So now you can say, okay, but uh, we know something. Assume that A is larger than N over 2. What can you say? Okay, if A, cardinality of A, is larger than N over 2, forget about here the ceiling and, and things like that and the, and the big O of 1 and this type of things. Okay, this is up to, up to big O of 1. But, uh, <coughs> If A is larger than N over 2, then you will get something which will tell you that A plus A is what? It is at most you, you suppress N over 2, so the room which remains is something which is um, two, uh, 2 N over, what? Uh, 2 N minus N over 2 is uh, 3 N over 2. So this is larger than 3 N over 2 and which is larger than A, than 3A. What do I say? Stupid things. This is at most. And so this is at most, and this is uh, less than 3A. OK? Ah, and then you start to think of something. Now you are in a very interesting situation because you know something about the shape of A, and so it should be possible to start with that. We'll find some other way, but it means that you know some structure of A. This is Freiman Frike theorem, or Frike minus three, if you want to quote it precisely. But if you know that A plus A is Z than three A, you already have a structure, and this, with this you can start building something with that. Okay, this will be used later on, but for the time being, we are going to find some better way to do that. Okay? So let us go to the, the first result we may have. It's not very, very strong, but uh, we, we start with that. We have a proposition. We say that um, let A be a sum free set of uh, 1N. then cardinality of A is indeed less than N over 2, the ceiling of N over 2. Essentially, this is what we can guess because thinking of it again and again and again, we, we don't find some good example telling you that you can go further than that. Okay, now we are going to prove it. So, proof. I try to alternate in some way with, uh, we'll try with, uh, with Balu to alternate between what is, uh, between some, giving some proofs and also giving some straight statement without proofs. You see, in six hours we can, uh, we cannot do uh, everything. But, okay, let us go to the proof of this. Okay, so we can call, of course, if we say that it is in one N, uh, it, we can even reduce it and just consider that n is the largest element of A. So to be precise and not to change, you can say without love of generality, you can assume that n belongs to A, or you can define what is the largest element of n. So okay, let n be the largest element of A. So the, the point is the following, that let A be in A, okay? Uh, so it is in one N, little n now. Then, and this is the trick, then N minus A is not in A. Indeed, what we are doing is the following, that if, we are, if the monoid is included in a group, then indeed you can have the reciprocal law, and to say that it is sum free, it is the same thing as to say it is difference free. Okay, in this equation, A plus B is equal to C, then it is the same thing to say that 
uh, a minus c is equal to b. And since it is for any a, b, c in the, in the group, it is the same thing. So to say that it is sum free, the same thing as being different three. This is a trick we are going to use quite a lot. Okay, so now you can look at the following. So, <coughs> and, uh, well, I, I'll do that later, but uh, of course. So for the time being, it means that each time you have one element in 1n, either this element is in, a, no, at most one of the two elements, a, and n minus a is in the set. Okay? So this is important. So, okay, so if a belongs to it, so the cardinality of a, the cardinality of a is at most the number of distinct pairs X, a, X, N minus X for X between 0 and N over 2. N over 2 is not possible because even if N is, if N is odd, of course, you cannot have N over 2. But if N is even, N over 2 is not admissible because then you have only one element in the pair, but uh, this is not possible because n over 2 plus n over 2 is equal to n. Okay, and it is sum free. So it is exactly the number, so it is the number of elements in this set. And the number of elements in this set, you know what it is. It is exactly the ceiling where was it written here. Okay? So this number is n over 2. So the cardinality of A is at most ceiling of n over 2. And the ceiling function is a non-decreasing function. Okay? And so this is at most n over 2. So it may not be too much, but it is a, a little good idea to say if something is sum free, it is also difference free. And with that, you really get a very short proof, some, the proof of the book in some way. You can do something complicated starting from that, but this is the proof of the book. I, I am not crossing, don't worry. Okay. So now we can start to do something else. Ah, oh, yeah. So. Now we will try to do something else, which is to count number of elements. So we want to count the number of some presets uh, in uh, 1n. You see, it was not that easy to create, of course we say we have the odd elements and so any subset of the odd element is fine. We have something which is this interval, if you want to take those which are large, and any subset of that. But beside that, it's not that, that easy to, to create some, uh, some elements like that with our sum free. So how many are there with this one? Well, with this one, the number of terms you have is something which is simply the number of subsets of a set with n over 2 elements. So this is something like 2 to the n over 2. And uh, for this one also, it is something like 2 to the n over 2. And so there was a conjecture. So this is Cameron and Erdős. Uh, which is to say that the cardinality, the number, uh, leave, leave one room, leave, leave one line here. The number of some free sets 
in 1n is big O of 2 to the n over 2. So essentially, you, you cannot imagine many things which are quite, with maximal elements which are, which are like that, and then it breaks, definitely. And uh, we would like to explore the fact that it breaks, but, um, and we'll do that, but uh, this is very difficult to, to prove. But indeed, this has been proved, it is a theorem, that has been proved by Ben Green in 2004, I think. Let me check. Yes, in 2004. This number is a big O of uh, 2 to the n. And it has been even improved by uh, Sapozhenko, which refines this result, theorem of Sapozhenko. I'm not going to prove that. Sapozhenko, 2008 which says the following, that there exists two constant. There exist C0 and C1, such that, indeed, the number of some free sets in 1n is equivalent to Ci, uh, 2 to the n over 2, if n is congruent to I mod 2. There's a slight dif difference between the fact that you have something which is odd or even. Well, this is quite natural because the, the number is something which is n over 2, and this definitely depends on the parity of n. Okay? So it may be slightly different. But indeed, if you take something for odd numbers, you will have an equivalence, a constant time uh, n over 2, 2 to the n over 2, and for even number, you have the, the same thing. Okay? So this was type of thing where no proof. But, so we are going to go back to the proof. And uh, we try to, to find out now what are the... So you, you see we are in the, um, definitely in the, the philosophy of Freiman. The philosophy of Freiman is to say, first of all, you try to find out what are the largest elements having such and such property. And then you say, OK, but if you are not too far from the largest element, what is the structure? Here, well, we don't know yet that those are the only examples with the maximal number of elements. So this is something we would like to prove, and we'll prove it. And at the same time, we'll prove also something that if a sum free set are a bit less than this number of elements, then we'll give exactly the structure of it. Okay? And this will prove it. So for that, we have to start with something which is just to understand a bit, to explore the idea that, uh, that you mentioned about arithmetic property. So we'll do that. And um, so we are looking at the sum free sets in arithmetic progression, or lying in arithmetic progression, a subset uh, lying in arithmetic progression. OK. So OK, let us start mod 3. Well, mod 3, you give this example with 1. You can imagine another one, 2. If it is congruent to 2 mod, uh, mod 3, it's fine, because the sum of two elements congruent to 2 mod 3 is something which is congruent to 1 mod 3. So OK, 1 or 2. If you, if you understand what I mean by that, I mean the elements which have a residue which is either 1 mod 3 or 2 mod 3. And it's not a 1 or 2, it's 1. This is one set, and 2 is another set. OK? So, but 4. Well, mod 4, you think also of that, and you, you notice that uh, you cannot do more than, uh, than one element. Because um, if you have one, or two, or three, fine, of course. And then you have a density which is one quarter and over four elements. So one, or two, or three. Being taken alone, this is fine. But as soon as you want to take two elements, if you take, for example, um, so if you take 1 and 3, 
Fine, you can click one and three, but one and three is exactly this one. Okay? So one and three is okay. Okay, but not new. And now if you have one and two or something, one and two doesn't work because one plus one is two. Okay? And you have no other possibility. You just have to work a bit. Mod five, ah, mod five, Start something interesting. Mod 5, if you take 1 and 4, it's fine. 1 plus 4 is not in, it's 0. 1 plus 4 is 0. 1 and 1 is 2. And 4 plus 4 is 3. So this works. This is fine. And by the way, this is interesting because this had a density which was one third. Density, I mean, the, the number of elements divided by the, the cardinality of the set. Hmm? Well, obviously, you have, you have seen this word before. Uh, this gives you a density which is 0.4, which is larger than this one. In some way, 5 is a, is a better model. Uh, but of course, it is always less than 1 half. There is no way to do something better. Uh, and also, let us say, or something which is 2 and 3. Okay, this will work for the same reason. Okay, so before going to the rest, I want to make a, a remark, and I am entering in some way, slightly touching what will be developed further later, the sum free set in Z over PZ. Five is prime, but uh, more or less by chance. There is something interesting in that, uh, in a way, this is, the same, this is the same example. Why is it the same example? Because if you take the following, if x, so let us say that we have the following. x is congruent to 2 or 3 mod 4 is equivalent to 2x is congruent to 1 of 4, mod 5, sorry, mod 5. 2 by 2 is 4 and 2 by 3 is 1. So it is the same. And this is also a property of some free sets in Z over NZ. If you multiply, maybe it's worth a remark, which will be used uh, when you want to say something about the, the structure of the sum free sets in uh, Z over NZ. A remark is that if A is a sum free set of, let us say, Z over NZ, and X is a uh, congruent to 1 is a co-prime with n, then uh, x times a, I mean by that x a when uh, a belongs to a, is also some free set, is also some free. You can factorize everywhere, and uh, you can simplify in Z over NZ because you have an element which is co-prime, so it will be exactly the same thing. So this is quite interesting. So in some way, let us say we just concentrate on this, two and three. Okay, now I let you work out what is mod six, and you find only something where you have two uh, congruence classes, and for seven, Again, there will be only two congruence classes, but if you start with eight, eight, you have something different, because you can add a different class. Uh, which one is it for eight? 
that I don't say something stupid. Three and four and five is okay. Okay, you can multiply this by three and say yes, but you may take also mod eight, uh, nine and 12 and 15. Just reduce it and it will give you another example. But more or less, thanks to this remark, it is the same. Now, if you, if you will try to, to see what it is, it gives you some nice picture. It gives you a nice picture if you take something which is mod, what is it? Um, five, eight, or oh, two also was, a, was an interesting example. Two gave you something interesting, you remember? Three didn't give you something as good. You are going just from a density one half to a density one third, one fourth, except this one, but we had it already. Or here, we are back to something which is two fifths, which is larger than what you had here and here. And this you have something else, so, okay, it's fine. Of course, with eight, you will find something with four progression and there is only one, it is when you take the odd numbers. But nothing is new there. So, okay, mod 3k minus one. Mod 3k minus one, what do you get? Well, you can do exactly the same construction and you have something which will be k k plus one, blah, 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 two uh, k minus one. Okay, if you take this, and, 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 so this is, this will give you residues, if you take an integer, which is congruent to k, k plus one, or etc. to two k minus one, modulo three k minus one, this is a subfree set, okay? And the density here, the density is uh, what? Uh, how many terms you have here? You have something which is a k plus one. Is it that between zero and I don't know k k plus one k k divided by three k minus one? Okay, and for. This, this gives you the sequence, which was one half, and then two fifths, and then something which will be three over eight, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And this is always larger, of course, than one third. But it will tend to one third when k is tending to infinity. And if you take the next one, the next one will be three k, then you have something where you have on always k, you cannot put more than that, and you have k divided by 3k, and it will be exactly density one third. So the impression you have with that is that you have something which is more or less discrete for the density that you may find out up to one third, and for one third, things starts to blow up. And in some way, this is because there are no, not many possibilities that Cameron and, uh, and Erdős conjecture this result, okay, that it is very, uh, uh, you have some structure in that. Okay. okay, now for one third, then at one third, everything blows up. You may find some other interesting result for one third. You see, if you put that on a, if you write z over nz like that, so here you have zero, one, Two, you put all the residues and this is n minus one. Okay, and this is zero. So you have z over nz, or z over nz that way. Essentially what we are saying is the following, that we take something which is between k and k and two k plus one. So this is something which will be more or less n over three and two n over three. I know it has no, no sense in, in Z over NZ, but it has a sense of the, you know, on the torus, if you wish. And so if you take something, a subset of this one here, 
Of course, it is sum free, because if you add those, you are already above this one. But if you have two of them here, you have below this one. So this is a way to get a, a sum free sets. Okay? And, uh, well, Balu will explain you for Z over PZ that this is really the structure of the, of the business. But um, if you are on the torus, you can imagine now that you may think, you may take something which is not arithmetic progression, but uh, which is something what, what is called a Bohr set. You, you take the following, you take your favorite irrational number, Gordon ratio or anything like that, at alpha, be an irrational number, and you consider the set of all the n, let us say up to capital N, I don't touch here the, the, the infinite uh, sum free sets, but the set of n for which the distance to the nearest integer of uh, rho n, it, sorry, alpha, rho is equal to alpha. Uh, it's not a theorem, but almost. Okay, such that, or let us say the fractional part may be better, to say the fractional part of alpha n is between one third and two third. Okay. This set is sum free. It's exactly the, the proof I gave you here. Okay, it's a sum free set. It's a sum free set. Okay. And so you, you see that uh, if you have at the level one third, the, the thing starts to explode and you may have very different things. But above one third, we believe that it is like that. Okay. I, okay, so now I, I'll go to the, the second part really to study the structure of the large sum free sets. I don't know if I'm too quick on some point, you tell me. If I'm, uh, if I'm too, too low on some point, you tell me too. It's fine up to now? Good. Okay, so the structure of large sum free sets in one end. So possibly I give you the, the theorem first and then we, we think of it. Ryman, uh, 1992. So let A be a finite set, finite set in A, in N. Finite subfree sets, sorry. So okay, we write, we use this notation in general, but uh, capital M of A is the maximal element of A, the maximum element of A, such that A belongs to capital A. So it is something which is, well, okay, it is the maximum of A. And uh, little m of A to be the minimal. I prefer to keep the notation with A. 
you, you understand better when you read the statement, it is easier to, to understand what it is than to say. Let us call it capital M and capital A and a little m, but, uh, okay. A such that A belongs to A, okay? Now, if A, capital A, the cardinality of A is larger than, so it will be something like the maximum, and you understand that what you want is to have a constant here which is less than one half, this is important. But on the other hand, you want also a constant which is larger than one quarter, if, if than a 0 0.4. If it is 0 0.4, this example will start to enter the matter, okay? So for the time being, just something which is between the two. So you take five over 12, but this is not much important. M of A plus two, okay, to be certain. And A contains, so of course, in A, is only as only odd numbers, we know it. It is a subset of the odd numbers and there is nothing much to say about that, okay? So well, we, we said that already, all the subset of odd numbers are, are some free sets. And we assume so that A contains an even number. Then, well, then the minimum cannot be too small. In some way, you, are, you remember when we had this n over two, the only thing we were able to find out were either the odd number or the element which starts at n over two. So then the minimum of A is larger, the minimum of A is larger than the cardinality of A and you have something else, which is, no, I don't cross. Uh, there's a big temptation to, to cross, especially if you say do not cross. It's, uh, okay. And cardinality of A intersection one, M over A over two. So you see this is the, in some way, the crucial part. You know that the part which is after M over t A over two is something which will, which will be more or less okay. But the small element, you don't have too many of them. This is at most MA minus two times cardinality of A plus three over four. So don't pay too much attention to this three and to this two to, to, to figure out what is the, what is the statement. The statement says if you have something which is maybe smaller than n over two, with a constant which is smaller than n over two, then either you are odd numbers, okay, fine, forget about that, or the, it contains an even number, then the minimum is not that small, it is larger than the cardinality of A, and the number of elements which are in the first part are not that many. Okay, so maybe we can try to find out a corollary of that immediately. So I forgot, for the time being, just with when waving hands, I forget the, um, the, 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 the constant and something like that. Assume that you have something with, we know that uh, we cannot have more than n over two elements in a sum free set. Assume that it has something like n over two elements. Okay, the cardinal of A, of A is n over two. Then it tells you that, well, forget about the odd numbers, but if you have one even number, at least I don't say the minimum of the even number, I say there is one even number, then the minimum is larger than A over two. So if cardinality of A is N over two, then you know that it is essentially the, the example I was giving before. There is no other possibility. And, 
and you have no element in this, uh, this interval and uh, everything is fine. So let, let me give the corollary, which is just slightly more complicated to corollary. The only some free subset, sub three sets in one N with cardinality N over two, we know that the cardinality cannot be larger than N over two. R well, uh, odd numbers. It's not a subset of the odd numbers. It is all the odd numbers, because you want to have this cardinality. So it has, you have to have all the all this term, and the intervals. Well, n over two n. This is the one we, we found. And there is just one little extra point, which is n, n over 2, n minus 1, in the case that f is, if, is, if f is even. This is just a little subtility, but it's essentially the same that we had. Okay. If n is even, you can go to the smallest one, which is odd, and you take, again, something which is n over 2n. Okay. And this you, with this, you can take, of course, you can take the value n over 2, because the value n over 2 is, uh, will be above. Okay. <clears throat> so essentially, the, the, I, don't, I don't give the proof in some way. The, the proof I gave you when waving hands, saying I don't care about the about the constant, just look carefully with the, with the big O of one terms and you'll find out this. So, okay, so we, we are happy with, the, with this. Okay, now the, the point is uh, just I would like to, to give, I think, well, more or less at the, at the end of the, of the matter. Since I want to, to give the proof of, uh, of that, I, I don't want to start the proof uh, right now. I think it's better to concentrate uh, tomorrow on the on the proof of uh, of this of this theorem, uh, just to give you some example. Some, I mean, some example not of the corollary. We we know everything about the corollary now, but about about this, saying that you can have something which is a bit smaller and understanding what is the structure which is written here. So example. Or well, maybe one example would be enough. So I assume that n is odd. n is large enough, larger than 50, 53, and m be such that uh, 11 n plus 18 is less than 24m and less than 12n minus 12. Again, don't forget too much about, forget about the, the, the constant. If you want to have something precise, you need those constant, but uh, this is not uh, the main part in it. Okay, and the construction is A is equal to the interval m, n minus 1 over 2, union, n minus m plus 1, 2m minus 1, and union n. By what is written, Little m is the smallest element of A, and uh, little n is the largest element of A. Okay, you have to, to check that the, the inequality between m and n leads to that. So, what is important, you can check that 
A is sum free. Okay. Cardinality of A is 4m minus n plus 1 over 2. Of course, m over m of A is equal to n. And so it's easy to deduce from that that cardinality of A is larger than 5m, oh, well, capital M of A times 2 plus 2. So you're in this. And A intersection 1 m a over 2 is, well, this is easy to check that it is m n minus 1 over 2. And so that the cardinality, uh, better to write it here. The cardinality of A intersection 1 m A over 2 is equal to m A minus 2 A plus 3 over 4. So in some way it tells you that the Freiman theorem is sharp. You can really build example for which, if you are a bit less than uh, than uh, capital A, n of a over two, you may have small elements. You don't have too many of them, but the bound which is given here is a good bound. You cannot improve on that. And uh, okay, this is essentially the a is equal to n. Okay, so this is a sharp result. So I think it's fine for for today. And uh, okay, you have saved two minutes, eighteen. Good.